I just want to say that you know it's 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 really great. It's it's amazing that you know on a the evening of a school night after work after school that I see this a broad amount of interest in cancer research. You know I think if we're to make a dent in the future in decreasing the incidence and also the ability to increasing the ability to cure uh, these awful diseases, I think that uh, you know it's going to take a group effort. And I'll just you know anecdotally I'll, I'll just say that you know I was. Uh, you know, a junior in high school sitting in an auditorium in Southern California, exactly where you are, not that many years ago, when I first really began to be interested in cancer research. That led to a lab opportunity at UCI, the University of California, Irvine, and that sparked a lifelong interest uh, in, in cancer research. So, uh, you know, I, I think that an important thing to do here is not only listen to, you know, some of, uh, you know, the events and work that other people are doing, but really think, well, you know, I'm interested in this particular strain of work. How can I be involved and how best to tailor my career to, A, work on something that you're interested in, but also to hopefully make a difference in the lives of, of patients who are really sick uh, with cancer. And so with that, I'll go ahead uh, and start. Um, in the first two talks, what you'll uh, have taken home basically is that you know, the cells themselves and the tissues themselves in development have alterations in behavior that can result in cancer or abnormal behaviors. The next level really to understand the market complexity of what goes awry from cancer metabolism to invasion to the inability to die when they should of a cancer cell is really to study these uh, cancer cells as a system. Uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago that Nixon actually proclaimed a war on cancer, right? I believe in the 60s, before my time actually. <laughs> and uh, what I'll... Um, you know, what, what I'll have to say is in, in reviewing his original uh, talk uh, in, in uh, you know, proclamation to the, to the, uh, the, um, t to the country uh, is that they would uh, beat cancer within the decade. Now that turns out not quite to be true. It turns out that, uh, you know, that cancer is a problem that is really markedly complex. There are many, many biological solutions to make a cancer extremely aggressive. And that this problem actually is more complex than putting a man on the moon or a man on the moon 14 times. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it really will depend on the next generation, everybody in this room, to really uh, bring forward some of the key findings and the progress that we've made in the last decade in order to uh, expand on uh, using this information to develop cures and diagnostics. So what I'm gonna talk about today, and this is a good segue into what I'm gonna discuss, is really finding needles in the haystack, making inroads into the cancer genome. In other words, which of the 22,000 plus genes in the hum human genome goes awry uh, in making a cancer? How to identify those and how to target those in a, uh, in a prioritized manner to be able to come up with new diagnostics and treatments to help our patients. So as, as Dr. Thompson had mentioned earlier, uh, you know, cancer is largely known now to be a genetic disease. And if you remember from your textbooks, uh, you know, in the middle of all our cells is the same complement of DNA. It's when mutations arise, either from mom and pop, unfortunately sometimes uh, cancer genomes are inherited, or uh, from smoking or from an outside insult. When the DNA gets damaged, what happens is proteins that, th that the DNA makes are also uh, altered and wrong. And these proteins then contribute to a really mean cancer cell, a, a cancer cell that used to be a normal cell, but now has the ability to grow out of control, doesn't listen to what people tell, the, tell it what to do, uh, i.e. the cells around them, including to go away and die or, or to keep on growing or not to open, not to keep the subway door open, you know, these kind of things. Uh, and to catch the next subway. <laughs> um, but anyway, so it becomes a very, very mean cell. Uh, and in, in, when you multiply this by thousands and thousands and, and hundreds of thousands, what you get is a tumor that could eventually uh, kill the patient. All right, so the take home message from this slide is basically that it all involves the DNA, or as I'll mention later, how the DNA is expressed or manifests itself in the different cells. How, how this turns into an aggressive cell that causes cancer, and then ultimately how the cancer then develops into a tumor uh, that needs to be treated. So 
how has our profiling of the tumor, of cancer tumors, advanced over the years? Uh, you know, I think about a century ago uh, when a lot of the original work was done and many of these cancers were being, uh, being uh, named and, uh, and first described in the medical literature both in the U.S. And in, and in Europe, it was largely staging. We were able to look at the tumor, we were able to feel the tumor, see where they come from, and really we were stuck at this stage for decades and decades, upwards around to about the 40s and 50s. That is just basically observing the tumor once a patient gets it. Uh, then our pathology colleagues developed different uh, tests and different uh, stains using antibodies you heard about in the previous talk and so forth to really figure out what the behaviors of those cancer cells. And lo and behold, they were able to discover that some of those cells behave differently, that under the microscope, you can actually tell whether some breast cancers, for instance, are gonna uh, misbehave more commonly and send out metastases, and, uh, and some of them are not. And these, the pathology really uh, is now an integral part of how we diagnose whether a tumor is aggressive or not, and also what types of tumors uh, they, uh, a patient has if that is difficult to determine up front. Well then, lo and behold, you know, as we progressed into, this, into the uh, 50s and 60s, we started looking at the, the microscopic level. We started being able to look at chromosomes and structural variations. We find that in some cancers, the alterations are, uh, are uh, there, there are a lot of alterations that really screw up the chromosomes, and we are actually able to name uh, some of those alterations and figure out what those are. Then afterwards, we're able to develop tests that we can actually use, like in the case of this HER2 gene in breast cancer, to really uh, reflect on if the tumor is going to spread. Nowadays, I think within the last a decade to decade and a half, we're able to actually do this in parallel. And one thing I'd like to take home from this, you know, as I go into, go into this portion about these systems-based approaches, is really what you can see as the marriage of different aspects of science. All right, here you can immediately see in these microarray chips that this entails a le level of organizational complexity that is beyond what you can simply look at uh, gene by gene. And so here we have a marriage of computer science, chemistry, and biology. And what I'd really like to emphasize uh, and for you to take home is that, that fields that are on, at the interface of, of different classically separate fields like computer science and biology are often the areas where you can make a very big impact because they all synergize with each other. And this actually occurred uh, you know, about uh, uh, you know, 15 years ago when computer technology synergized with biology and we were able to, uh, to make uh, these types of gene arrays, these microarrays which you ha may have heard about, in, um, in the newspaper. And using these microarrays, we're able to query, we're able to ask the question, what are the totality of changes that occur all across the cancer genome? Now, only within the last, I would say, two to three years, are we now able to sequence the entire genome. When I first started in science, it was inconceivable that we could do this at, at the present rate. When the whole human genome started, um, uh, you know, with the government uh, funding an effort to sequence every gene in the human genome. You know, it was completed with that technology uh, at that time in about 10 years plus. Nowadays, we can, we can sequence the entire human genome using a desktop mach size machine in one day. So the advancements are just uh, astronomical. And with all this data, though, comes an additional problem. How do we make sense of all of this? And that's what my lab uh, really is focused on. Now, before I, I go there, though, what I'll simply mention is that uh, you may ask the question, why is this important? This is an example of some early uh, tumor profiling using microarrays, in this case uh, generated by a group in Europe, uh, developing a molecular test for breast cancer. Molecular, uh, breast cancer, is, it's been known by a lot of oncologists who see these types of patients uh, behave very differently from patient to patient. Sometimes the same size of a tumor in one patient won't metastasize, a surgeon will take it out, and the patient will be cured forever, all right? Other tumors that are the exact same size and location in another patient will be able to send out metastases and that patient's in a whole lot of trouble. Just looking at the tumor, you're unable, we previously were unable both with pathology and anatomic staging to be able to separate these two. And 
just emphasizing the power of molecular diagnostics, uh, this group was able to develop an FDA-approved uh, test right now to be able to, at the molecular level, separate out uh, tumors of the same size and stage, which uh, uh, will not metastasize and which will metastasize. So this just emphasizes the importance of and, and the potential benefit uh, to our patients uh, that some of this molecular profiling work that we do uh, can, can uh, bring about. So my lab's focus uh, is really, uh, you know, I'm trained as a cancer genetic, geneticist, uh, and uh, my, the focus is on cancer genomics. And we use uh, integrated genomic approaches, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, to identify and characterize novel cancer genes of clinical relevance as potential new targets or biomarkers that can enhance the uh, ability uh, and options for us uh, to give our patients. And our current efforts right now involve a combined genomic analysis to, to identify novel genes that drive some specific human cancers, mainly brain cancers, and I mainly treat brain cancers in the hospital, and also breast cancer. Uh, and uh, Dr. Thompson alluded to this a little bit earlier. You know, I, I, I talk about, well, you know, there's a, there's a lot of genes, all these microarrays. What exactly are we detecting? What are the genes that are likely to be involved uh, in causing cancer? Well, uh, as, I, as mentioned before in the first talk, these can be classified into oncogenes or tumor suppressors. And I like to use the analogy of the car. An oncogene basically is the accelerator pedal, all right? It makes the car go faster. It makes cell division go faster, whereas a tumor suppressor is really a brake, and that puts the hold on cancer. So you can get a cancer, in other words, a runaway car, either with a stuck uh, accelerator pedal, like in your Toyota, or <laughs> a defective, or in your, uh, with, with a defective brake like if you don't change your brake pads on time. And so that, that the, both uh, alterations can cause a runaway car, or in this case, a, uh, a tumor. Now, I'll, I'll mention a third uh, element, and this, this is you know, very hot in the literature and so forth, but epigenetics is also important as well. This is essentially a cellular memory. Now, every cell in your body, a skin cell, heart cell, muscle cell, gut cell, all has the same DNA. Right, and yet they're different cells. And the reason why they are different is because of differential expression from this cellular memory. The cellular memory in a heart cell is different than the memory in your thyroid cell, is different than in the brain cell. And so what this essentially equates to is a GPS all right, in a car. In other words, making sense of the uh, velocity of the car and directing where the car is going to go. So one example of why we should all care about this is really the example of the Philadelphia chromosome. Charles Sawyer's, uh, uh, you know, uh, very own Dr. Sawyer's, uh, you know, was instrumental in developing a drug to treat this particular lesion in leukemias. Uh, it was known pretty, uh, you know, several decades ago that um, two genes are altered, a ABLE and BCR, in leukemia. These come together abnormally, forming the Philadelphia chromosome, as shown here in this fish assay, which I mentioned earlier. And the combination of these genes uh, makes an oncogene, an, an uncontrollable, uh, uncontrollable uh, gas pedal being pressed down. And this is required for the growth of the chronic myelogenous leukemia, a form of leukemia. Uh, and a lot of effort was used to develop drugs against uh, BCR able. Uh, namely the first one being imatinib. And this drug, knowing the biology and knowing how to target this lesion, has essentially converted what used to be a lethal uh, disease into something that's chronic and manageable now. So that's really the power of molecular profiling, that one can really uh, you know, figure out what exactly is wrong at the DNA level of, in cancer cells and hopefully design treatments to target uh, these lesions. However, it is not that simple. Sometimes Dr. Sawyers doesn't, you know, enjoy my mentioning this over and over again, but in solid tumors, this is not so simple. And uh, an uh, investigator, Bert Volosin, was first able to describe what's called the multi-step model of carcinogens. That is, in most cancers, colon cancer, breast cancer, all the bread and butter cancers that afflict people around the world, many, many genes, perhaps sometimes even dozens of genes, are required to be uh, mutated or uh, overexpressed and so forth, and that the combination, the constellation of these genes gives rise to uh, most cancers. So that 
that, you know, you know, you can immediately realize that presents a, a, a big problem. Here you have 22,000 genes, not all, some of which are important for driving uh, uh, cancers, and there's not just one. There's a, a, a combination of them. Furthermore, these combinations of genes may be different from tumor to tumor. So immediately you real, realize that one really needs sort of a more systematic, high throughput approach to a, address what has really gone awry in a lot of these cancers. And so uh, one of the things, that, uh, one of the uh, efforts that our lab is, is, is heading up is really trying to identify what, what is in common between a lot of these cancers. We focus on brain cancers and breast cancers and to, to, uh, dis, to identify some commonalities uh, in the genetic alterations. So, again, just to emphasize the complexity of human malignancies, this is going to be on your test, so make sure you write everything down here. Um, no, seriously, though, I mean, I, I put this up here not because of the detail, but simply uh, for us to realize how complex the human cancer problem is. Uh, and over time, before high throughput approaches in genomics, uh, you know, there has been some success. Uh, in other words, the scientist, you know, who looks at a little days, says he found it, and this other uh, PI says, oh, well, congratulations, it only took you one times 10 to the 10th seconds to, to find this. So <laughs> using low throughput approaches, uh, you know, the accumulation of knowledge was substantial, but it was much uh, at a slower pace. These days, with high throughput approaches, which I'm going to talk about now, uh, the, the rate of discovery is now accelerated. Now, there are a lot of different technologies, and the purpose of this talk is not simply to teach you about every single type of technology, but what we can touch on are some of the basic principles of microarray design and analysis. Microarrays have, uh, have arguably have been one of the uh, platform uh, tools that have really revolutionized uh, uh, computational biology and systems biology, especially in terms of cancer research. And so how microarrays work, are basically these little glass slides, and uh, these glass slides are imprinted with many, many different uh, genes or messenger RNAs or what have you, uh, all at the same time. And you can assay them by putting on the sample that you want. And the important thing to remember is that like snippets of DNA in these two samples, or like nucleic acids, will stick together. All right? So basically, it's a very simple concept. What you can take home, basically, is that these arrays, which are the same, will allow us to tell the difference between the two samples that you put in, or as many samples as you want to analyze. And then, using computers, we're actually able to uh, take a picture of all this and really figure out what are the system-wide differences all over the genome. And so this is actually a picture of a microarray. Um, and you can, you can immediately see that no human being could have blot, put on every single little dot on there, all right? So this is an example of the marriage of computer science and, and material science with biology. It turns out, out that out in Stanford, how this technology was developed was using in inkjet uh, piezoelectric printers. Uh, and what they did was basically they were able to spot these arrays onto uh, it, very, very close together with a lot of different genes, every single gene in the human genome, and now we're able to query uh, the changes in expression all at once. And so it's not just messenger RNAs or RNAs that we're able to, to look at now. We can also look at DNA copy number, right? Every uh, a cell in the body most of the time has two uh, copies of every gene, one from your mother, one from your father. We can assay how these copy number changes ch uh, are different in cancers. Sometimes you have too many copies of an oncogene or too few copies of a tumor suppressor gene. DNA polymorphisms we can detect. In other words, why is it that Uncle Joe smoked and he's all his life, he's 90, he's never gotten lung cancer, but yet uh, a friend of mine down the road who's 30 years old uh, has never smoked and has gotten, gotten lung cancer. This question is really largely tied in with the polymorphic makeup of, of one's DNA. Also DNA methylation, which is an alteration in, uh, in cellular memory. So here, what you can see is that this is close, this is blown up here, and each little square that you can make out here is really one gene, okay, or one part of the genome. And by, remember, like DNA snippets uh, stick together, and what you can find is that once you hybridize or mix your sample onto it, you can detect, you know, what areas or what genes are uh, overexpressed, where you have more, and what's less. And by summing up all of these different little squares, we're able to figure out uh, all the different defects in 
the uh, cancer genome all at once. And so uh, my lab works intimately on this question, and, and this question actually turns out to be exceedingly complex. All right? For decades and decades now, uh, it's known that there are areas that in many, many different types of cancers which are missing, all right? these so-called tumor suppressors that I mentioned, some of which are listed here, one on two, one on 10, where P10 is, one on nine, P23, and so forth. And there are regions that are, uh, that are uh, exposed to genetic loss in many, many different types of cancers. And our interest really is to really synthesize all of this across multiple different cancers and use this, this type of high throughput approach to figure out commonalities between different cancers, to look for tumor suppressors that are basic to the uncontrolled growth of a lot of different types of tumors. Because ultimately, what it boils down to is a cancer, A, uh, either has an uncontrolled ability to grow or B, a defective ability to die. And that, and there are only certain, limit, there's a limited number of biological solutions to which that can happen, all right? So my assumption is that, you know, we are, we are some of those commonalities are the same and that we, we, and we seek to uh, identify those. So what are we doing in the lab? We, we're using large, large data sets uh, across the whole genome for uh, deletion, copy number alterations, mutation. We're generating a lot of this in our own lab with next generation sequencing technologies, these sequencing machines that can sequence a whole genome in one day, methylation. Uh, and we're trying to find the commonalities between all these different tumors, breast cancers, colon cancers, and glioblastomas. While they occur in different parts of the body, they, are also, they also have common themes, that is a inability to stop growing and an inability to die when they should, when they're abnormally growing. So this is just a snapshot, a little taste of some of the data that we're able to generate. Uh, this happens to be in, 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 uh, in, uh, in uh, brain cancers. And what, you, what one does is synthesize all the microarray data, and you can line them up across the human genome, 22 uh, you know, autosomes here. And there are certain areas where we can focus in on where there are many, many recurrent lesions. And what we do is we compare all of these across many, many genomes, use uh, our computer programs to look for patterns and go after certain driving genes, which may be good diagnostics, uh, the basis of good diagnostics and targets. And so I'll just, uh, you know, sort of, um, you know, wrap up some of the findings that we found in terms of one very interesting gene that we found. For a couple decades, there was a, uh, it was known that there's a um, tumor suppressor on 9P23. Now, this is chromosome 9. I'll show it to you here. Nobody knew what the lesion was. It's very close to another gene called P16, which is another tumor suppressor. And so uh, it was very difficult to separate out what this is. Well, using our, comp our comprehensive approach, we were able to find that this is a gene called PTPRD. It's a phosphatase, which means that it acts to remove phosphates from other proteins. So it's involved in, uh, in the ability of cells to communicate inside the cell. Uh, and, um, and it's inactivated in 50% of glioblastomas, 30% of metastatic melanomas, uh, in a lot of breast cancers, colon cancers, and lung cancers. So the inactivation of this gene, PTPRD, seems to be very, a very common event in a lot of different cancers, suggesting that it might be a good target to, uh, to look at further. And we sequenced, using these high thorough approaches, many, many different cancers, lung cancer, gliomas, colorectal cancer. You can see that the, uh, these little uh, triangles are basically mutations. And you can see that the mutations occur all over the place in many, many, uh, in many different types of cancers, suggesting that this is fundamentally important for how cancer cells go awry. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is just a little bit of the taste of what we uh, do in the lab to show that what comes up in the genomic screens uh, actually has some functional significance that they can really affect the growth of cancer cells. We're able to make in the lab these, uh, these mutations in the gene. So this is the full gene with a mutation here, a mutation here. This mutation here actually breaks the protein. It puts a stop codon in, meaning a, a, a codon, if you remember in biology, that tells the protein to stop uh, making, uh, proceeding with making the protein. And what you can tell is that whereas the normal PTPRD phosphatase, when you put it in cancer cells, it really suppresses growth. The, mut the mutants all have an inability to block uh, cancer cell growth. And 
what we then did was ask the question, well, is this important in humans? We're able to uh, get together a lot of uh, patient-based data with a lot of different uh, patients that either did well or did not. And what we basically showed was that as the grade of brain tumors increased, uh, it reached a point where at grade four, the most aggressive form of glioma or glioblastoma, PTPRD levels drop down. Okay, so it seems to be involved in uh, changing a cell, uh, a brain cell, from a, a lesser grade to one that is very, very aggressive. And patients that did not survive three years uh, preferentially had a loss of this gene. Uh, and in looking at, uh, you know, one of the questions uh, in looking at brain tumors with lower grades is that this, just like breast cancer, is a very heterogeneous disease. Some patients will do great, they'll live 10 years, other patients will, will have a GBM developed from their lower grade tumors and they'll do very bad. There's no really good test to figure out which of uh, the types of brain cancers that you have. And it seems like here, PTPRD plays a role in that. We put together genome-wide data sets for uh, many patients with lower grade gliomas. Patients that have high PTPRD actually do better, and patients that have low PTPRD uh, where this is inactivated actually do very, very bad. And that suggests that this could potentially be used as a clinical test to try to separate out which patients really need more therapy and more aggressive surgery, more aggressive radiation and chemotherapy to help control these tumors. So uh, last two slides or so, what are we doing in the lab to try to take advantage of PTPRD and what we know about it? Well, through a lot of biochemistry, we're able to show that PTPRD is a prime regulator of this pathway called the STAT pathway. The STAT pathway, if you know, it, the details don't matter, but basically it's one of the primary uh, oncogenic pathways. So again, it turns out now that this tumor suppressor is directly involved in the normal regulation of an oncogenic pathway here. And when you lose this uh, PTPRD uh, tumor suppressor, STAT3 becomes hyperactive, causing the cell to continue to grow out of control. We're actually able to use some off-the-shelf drugs to, to figure out whether there is a, a differential sensitivity of uh, brain tumors to inhibition of the positive signal here the gas pedal, okay? And we found that when you lose this gene in PTP, if you lose this gene, you're very, very sensitive to inhibition. So somehow the, 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 uh, the uh, glioma cell, the brain cancer, is very addicted to this pathway here. And that this potentially uh, represents a nidus in which we can target uh, the cancers and hopefully control tumor growth. So in summary, uh, hours getting late. Um, cancer genomics is a very fast-moving field at the forefront of cancer research. I honestly, honestly believe that as technology continues to improve, it will really, uh, it really drive cancer research at least for the next decade. It, will, we, it allows researchers to discover what goes wrong in cancer faster and more thoroughly. The challenge though, and I'll put this to you, the challenge really is to make sense of all this data, all right? And that's where I think, um, you know, as you it, it, uh, potentially get involved in science, you have to think about. Uh, if you have a model, if you have um, an idea of how to best synthesize and make sense of all this, that's when you're gonna, where you're gonna make the most impact. And, just, and to just really quickly sum up, one candidate gene we found was the successful identification of the second 9P tumor suppressor. It functions by regulating the STAP protein. And right now we're working on ways to bring this into the clinic and to, uh, to make a drug that can target this pathway. So with that, um, I'll end and I'll be open for questions. Questions for Tim. Same rules apply. You have to come up to the microphone. I think what Tim has told us about is uh, really a, a paramount of this engineering problem that occurs when computers are capable of. And what he's really been able to show us is how you can quickly move from this massive amount of information to actually what he actually told you about in that last slide, didn't have enough time, is a new drug that's actually going to go in and treat patients immediately. So the speed at which we can do things has been dramatically accelerated. Just the way the speed at which you can work and do your work has been accelerated by computers. We have a question up here. Uh, all right. So you told us that cancer it has to have a multi-mutational basis. 
So is it possible that given a tumor suppressant gene like your gene or the RAS gene, if we can in vitro reverse it using like a technique like micro mRNA, can we somehow freeze it or even reverse cancer? Well, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, there there's, was a lot of effort, especially in the last uh, decade, five to ten years, uh, trying to develop ways to put nucleic acids like microRNAs and so forth into different cells or antisense you may have, uh, have heard about. Um, that's difficult. While uh, gene targeting for cancer is a rapidly moving field and shows promise, I think, um, you know, where the field is heading now is really the development of small molecules. Remember, these compounds have to get into the gut, get into the cells, and get into the nucleus once it gets into the cell and, and do its thing there. So, uh, so small molecules right now are, uh, is where a lot of the emphasis is, but who knows? I think, you know, uh, the technology could potentially just be around the corner to deliver uh, nucleic acids in a very effective manner. I think only time will tell. Another question here. Um, what are the advances that have led us to be able to map the entire human genome in one day rather than 10 years? In one day? Uh -huh. uh, well, uh, I didn't really touch on this here, but uh, it's largely um, what's called next generation sequencing. Um, and through sort of a marriage of chemical material science, computational biology, and biology, we've now developed at least four different platforms where you can just take apart the genome, throw it all on one big microarray, and synthesize each, each little molecule uh, individually. It's called synthesis, sequencing by synthesis, right? And so that's the basis of how we can sequence an entire genome in, in one day. Um, now, it, now, if you think about this, and you think about this very carefully, uh, you realize that it only makes sense if there's a reference genome to compare it to. Because once you break up the genome, you realize that it's in pieces and you need a template. And that's where, uh, you know, uh, projects like the Human Genome Project, you know, was exceedingly helpful, you know, in allowing biologists to do their work, to develop a template for future work. I'll go to the next question here. Okay. Um, do we know what causes these mutations? Absolutely. Now, that, that is a million dollar question. I think if you figure that out, you will be very, very rich. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think that. Uh, I sort of touched on this. I, there are some unfortunate patients that do have this, uh, 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 this in their families. So if mom and pop, you know, um, pass this on to you, such as in the case of the BRCA1 gene, that's in your DNA already. Every cell in your body has that. It's clear that other environmental factors can cause mutations. So either uh, pollutants, drugs, um, uh, you know, and so forth, smoking, a lot of different things, radiation can actually cause DNA to be damaged, misrepaired, and then for it to develop into, uh, to contribute to cancer. So the answer is both from inside and from outside are the sources of mutation. Next question. Okay, uh, I know you touched on it earlier with the carbohydrates. So uh, one of the questions I have is, is it a specific type of carbohydrate that increases the chance of uh, mutations or uh, cell growth, or is it the process the body does goes through to get rid of the carbohydrates well, in the blood? For you, right? yeah. Well, again, we'll, we'll all be available after this, and we're going to finish when Tim's questions are done to answer questions individually. So we'll, we'll, the three of us will stay around for those kind of questions. In terms of one of the biggest unknowns, which is what Tim just went, we know that it's these mutations in the genes we've inherited that actually give us uh, have a single cell cause cancer. Tim's told you the complexity of those mutations. The biggest unknown that people in this room could contribute to if you got involved in being interested in research and doing science for a living the way we do is to actually try and understand what causes this increased mutation rate. We have an answer for about 15% of the reasons why people have increased rates of mutation and therefore increased risk of cancer, and that's people that unfortunately come from families that have a defect in how we repair DNA. But most of the cases of cancer, we don't understand what caused that increased rate of mutation that actually drives the process that Tim just told us about. Some of it has to do with overeating, but it's only some of it. Some of it has to eat with things that are called carcinogens. Tobacco is the best example. We've known for almost 100 years now that tobacco has something in it that mutagenizes our ability to inherit DNA 
and that's being unraveled at the true chemical basis. But it's a huge unknown, and that's one of the things we really want to convey today. This is, in, I hope you heard from all three of us, we find this an incredibly exciting thing to do for a living. There are lots of questions, you guys have done a good job of uh, right getting to the heart of them, that are really unknown. It doesn't matter what you learned in your textbook, what you answered on the biology test. It's a simplification to what we need to know to really empower human health and advantage society. And you guys are here because you're interested in that. And all we can tell you, I've been doing it a very long time. It's still extremely exciting to come to work every day and hang out with really smart people who are fascinated by biology and want to transmit that into better human health. And so we, have, we don't know the answer to the question yet. Okay, so we need I, to know. So since you don't know for, for that one, uh, I have another one. So I know you were talking about using smaller molecules to treat cancer. Are you referring to nanotechnology? Um, yeah, well, that, that's, a, um, that's a, a, a burgeoning field right now. Um, there are certain nano uh, probes and nanotechnologies which can deliver drugs more effectively and also sensitize cancer cells to radiation. Yeah, that's part of the equation, but other parts of the equation are, uh, go from small molecules, which I have mentioned, mm -hmm. to even putting nucleic acids in, uh, even to uh, you know, altering the effects of uh, radiation on cells, so a lot of different avenues. Okay, two last questions and then we'll close up for the day. Okay, so you mentioned that there are, you're working on treatments. Uh, do you have a timetable for when they might be in use and how effective they might be? Well, I think that's a great question. I, I think, um, you, know, I, I, you know, that's a very difficult question to answer. I think that what I can say is with F, the, uh, the scope of FDA approval and the, and the rate of uh, development of new drugs, the pace is increasing. However, many, for every drug that, that gets in, there are at least 500 to 1,000 that don't make it. Okay? Uh, and uh, a lot of that will depend on, um, on uh, safety, on the bioavailability, the ability to take this into the body, uh, the toxicity levels. So all those are unknown. And that actually is an area of, of great research and potential career options. And that is to develop design trials and to uh, and, and work with uh, pharma, uh, pharma companies in order to, to, to uh, develop and optimize these kinds of, of, of delivery methods. So the answer is I don't know, but it's different for every, every drug. And last question. Um, I understand that next-gen sequencing is a phenomenal and a beautiful multifaceted tool um, for cancer research, but I'm curious as to what about epigenetics since that's such a key, DNA methylation is such a key indicator for chemoresistivity and um, other um, active genes. Are there any um, tools out there that can help indicate um, what level of DNA methylation has occurred in regards to cancer or like peritoneal fluids or neoplasmia in tumors? Well, the uh, questions are really, really spectacular, I'll tell you that. The, the, uh, um, the, you know, she hasn't had a really good answer yet. Uh, the, the short answer is yes, the technologies do exist. With next generation sequencing, you can actually sequence methylated Cs versus non-methylated. Mm -hmm. There are also a variety of arrays now where we can actually query the methylation levels as well as the histone state levels. Um, unfortunately, some of those technologies are still uh, quite difficult to apply. Looking at histone state, for instance, it's still very difficult to take primary cancer cells and, and study them. But the technology is rapidly uh, moving forward. So I think that the answer is yes, partially we do have tools, but I think that you know every couple months a new platform comes online. So it's a moving target. Yeah, thank you. So I want to bring this to a close. Every, I want to thank all of the questioners. <laughs>